Hello, and welcome to the Cantor Fitzgerald Understanding Markets Briefing. Today is the afternoon of the 8th of March, 2022, and I'm delighted to be joined by our Chief Investment Officer, David Beaton. David, whilst the news out of Ukraine continues to worry us on a humanitarian level, I think it's fair to say markets have captured our attention this week after another tumultuous day yesterday. Yes, uh, and good afternoon, Helen, and good afternoon, everyone. Certainly, the the situation in Ukraine, as you rightly point out, uh, puts everything in financial markets into context with the humanitarian and civil displacement that's going on there. But from a financial markets perspective, certainly it's been a, 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 a bolt from the blue, so to speak, almost two years to the month after the COVID crisis, um, crisis back in February 2020. We had another uh, major market event on our hands. And uh, certainly the level of, of uh, kind of response from the Western allies has, has picked up significantly in relation to the level of the sanctions that they're imposing on Russia. And that clearly has been a destabilizing factor for investor sentiment um, uh, over the course of the last week and, and indeed since, since the conflict began almost two, two weeks ago. Um, and I suppose to put it in context, the, the, the main focus, I think, for markets has been on, on the commodity space and, and the impact that the sanctions um, are having uh, on, on potentially those areas of the markets. Uh, and I'll touch on maybe the oil one in a moment. Um, but you know the sanctions to date have very much been financial uh, targeting of, of the Russian uh, uh, system, uh, be it oligarchs, be it Putin himself, be it the regime. Um, but the knock-on effect of this has been that um, you know, Russia is a dominant supplier of a vast range of commodities uh, to uh, not just the globe, but particularly Europe. And if you look at the energy complex, um, you know, uh, Russia is the third largest producer of oil uh, outside of the US and uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, it accounts for 11 percent of global production. Uh, it's accounted, it's the uh, second largest gas uh, producer outside of the US and accounts for 17% of global production. But critically from a European perspective, and this is why we're seeing the Euro and European markets significantly underperform um, their uh, global counterparts, Europe imports 40% of its gas consumption from uh, Russia. So, you know, any, any risk of a supply disruption out uh, of, of those uh, of, of the Russian region to Europe, particularly on the gas side, uh, is problematic from a growth perspective within Europe. That is pretty shocking numbers there, to be fair. And I think it's also fair to say that this is putting central banks in a real difficult position because, of course, we've already experienced a great deal of inflation thanks to supply chain issues caused by COVID. Um, and now we're seeing the higher oil prices at the pumps. Um, it's, it's shot up very rapidly in the last week. Um, and so what do you think, central banks, what can their response be at this point? Well, I think as we've seen over the course of the last year or two, uh, there's been a kind of a, a dual path or, um, kind of emerging with the central bank policy, with the Federal Reserve obviously very keen to try and normalise its monetary policy by increasing rates and reducing its balance sheet. Uh, the ECB has been much more persistent in its in its line of of defense of higher inflation saying that it was going to be continue to be transitory and would moderate during the second half of this year and early 2023 uh, however that dynamic has now changed um, to a certain extent uh, with regard to the us uh, i think the us will be still keen the federal reserve will still be keen to normalize policy but maybe not as aggressively as the market had been pricing in before this event occurred. Uh, before this happened, the market was pricing in as many as six or seven interest rate hikes in the US in 2022. That's come back somewhat to about four increases, still significant. Um, Europe, on the other hand, with the problems that it's facing, as I mentioned earlier on, on the, the energy supply side of things, 
uh, is looking at a situation that inflation, uh, while it is getting out of control from their perspective, they also need to be mindful of the economic damage that any tightening of policy might add to any uh, industrial production disruption that may occur because of uh, higher energy prices. And I should also mention, it's not just energy prices that are, are, are kind of the, the issue here as well. Between Russia and Ukraine, they provide 27% of global wheat supply. So it's not just at the petrol pumps, and it's clearly very evident, and you're seeing we're seeing it in home heating bills, etc. cetera, um, but the input costs for an awful lot of day-to-day -day raw materials and, and consumable goods such as, such as bread uh, are all uh, seeing significant in increases because of the uh, supply disruption caused by the uh, Russian invasion into Ukraine. So the central banks have a very difficult balancing act on their hands at the moment. Um, but I still expect the Fed to gradually increase rates, but I think they will be very mindful of the pace of those increases, given the, over, the, uh, the underlying geopolitical tensions that are there. That's very thorough overview on that side of things. And in terms of something that I'm getting asked on a daily basis, and I know that you are also trying to, to work out what our investors and our clients should be doing at this point. Yeah, I mean, it's an extremely volatile situation, as we said. Um, clearly, Europe has underperformed. I mean, if you look at the DAX year to date, it's down about 18% compared to the S&P, which is down around about 11%. Not a huge amount of a difference, but you've also would have got a, a currency appreciation on the dollar, which is appreciated by three and a half or 4% over the uh, duration of this crisis. Um, so our preference really at the moment would be um, leaning towards US given that it is slightly that further bit removed from the ongoing situation from, a, from an economic perspective in Europe, uh, that, or sorry, that Europe faces because of the situation. And also, I think, because we still favor a lot of the growth focus names in particularly the technology area, uh, profitable names like Microsoft and Apple, who have uh, global businesses. Um, they've been quick to distance themselves and remove themselves from any, any um, involvement in Russia with any business ties. Um, but those are the type of companies that aren't, uh, to a large extent, inflation immune, uh, particularly the likes of a Microsoft. Um, so they don't have that headwind. Um, I think the likes of healthcare as well uh, offers a, a, a very um, defensive type of area. But I think if clients who maybe have cash sitting on the portfolio, maybe looking to see if it's the time to move into the markets right now, Personally, I, I'm probably inclined still to, to, to get a bit more clarity on, on what happens. We have uh, President Biden speaking later this afternoon about a possible oil embargo on Russia that could put pressure on Europe to do the same thing, although the Germans are very much against it. Uh, but if the Western allies come together and decide that they are going to ban the use of all uh, Russian energy, um, you could see further uh, increases in, in crude oil prices. So that would further destabilize the market. So I think an area like precious metals, gold and silver, the traditional safe havens in these types of uh, on these times of uncertainty, um, they haven't really performed as aggressively as some other commodities, but they do offer uh, a good defensive haven in these times of uncertainty. Yeah, it's, uh, certainly that is the, one of the purposes of gold is to act as that particular safe haven. And I suppose slightly more medium term, uh, we've also got the push towards clean energy and push away from the, the likes of our reliance on a country like Russia. Um, so I assume we'll start seeing spending and government spending in that area. Yeah, absolutely, Helen. And, and the, the, the renewable space is an area that we've been very positive on over the course of the last year and a half or so. But as, as, as concerns about higher interest rates fed through and supply chain disruptions caused issues in relation to some of the raw materials that are used in that space, um, the sector has fallen out of favour. Uh, but what we've seen in the, in, in the height of this sell-off is a big rotation back into the likes of the, the renewable names like Vestas Wind Systems, Siemens Gamesa Renewable Energy, Orsted uh, out of Denmark. Um, and, and really what this crisis has shown is, as you 
exactly rightly say that Europe's dependency on one source or supply of a particular commodity uh, leaves it very vulnerable. And, and what we've seen today now is, is uh, stories emanating out of Europe that the EU ministers are possibly going to look at some uh, major issuance of bonds later in the week or sometime over the course of the next uh, number of weeks, similar to, to what they did to help governments through the fiscal pressure of the kind of uh, pandemic um, that would be targeted on investment into renewable energy and also to aid defence spending to, to, to bolster the, the, uh, the cause of, of Ukraine. Um, and you know, clearly NATO do not want to get involved in military uh, activity in the region, but this is a way that Europe can work around that and support the Ukrainian uh, people. Yeah, and of course, we've seen that shock announcement out of uh, Germany, that uh, complete 180, that they're about to start spending more on the defence side of things. Um, turning to something a bit more uh, taking advantage of the central banks pushing out the uh, interest rate increases, I suppose, and something we were talking about on the uh, within the investment committee meeting was the uh, use of REITs, the real estate investment trusts. Um, is, is that something you would be um, a supporter of? Yes, absolutely. I mean, if you look at two, two of the ones that we particularly like would encounter are uh, Hibernia REIT, um, the Dublin office um, management and rental company. Um, even through the even through the worst of the pandemic, it was uh, accruing ninety seven percent of its rents. It's trading at about a twenty eight percent discount to its net asset value, and and under a REIT structure, it has to pay uh, up to seventy five percent of its of its free cash flow after all its costs by way of dividends. So that's generating a yield of about four point nine percent. Uh, stock was traded back off quite aggressively in this move, unjustifiably so in our opinion, uh, and certainly it's it, 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 it's an area where someone, uh, where you're looking at a central bank like the ECB that's unlikely to increase rates this year now because of the situation, negative deposit rates, uh, uncertainty in the markets overall, it does offer uh, a relatively attractive area. Another one in the UK would be the supermarket income REIT. Uh, it, 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 it leases out properties uh, and sites to some of the large largest uh, UK supermarkets such as Sainsbury's, Tesco, uh, etc. Uh, and again, under the REIT structure, it pays out a very significant dividend. And again, the yield on that is about 4.9%. So there are a couple of areas that investors could look at just to park some money uh, on a short term basis and also pick up a bit of yield. Wonderful. Thank you so much, David. I know that our clients really appreciate your insights. And all I would say to anybody out there um, watching, please do talk to your Cantor Fitzgerald broker. Uh, they will talk to you about your own specific portfolio. And do please read the warnings. We are in highly volatile markets, so it's worth assessing exactly what would be right for you. Many thanks and goodbye.